Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Petrie. I'm the team lead for the Agile product design team, or the APD team, this semester. Uh, this semester was, was noteworthy for two different reasons. The first was that this is actually only the second semester that the APD program has even been in existence. Uh, it's a very, very unique program. Um, the team as a whole starts off the semester trying to pinpoint a particular problem that they want to solve. And then they iterate um, on different prototypes of different solutions of how to obviously solve that problem. But what's particularly unique about the APD team is that they take those prototypes and they get them into the hands of the end users. Um, in our case, it ended up being robotic surgeons. Uh, more to come, don't worry. <laughs> um, so that offers a very, very unique aspect that, that I think is uh, incredibly important to the CCW program as a whole. The second reason that this semester was noteworthy was that we've been told this is the first time that a CCW team needed to get immunizations in order to complete their project. Um, at the beginning of the semester, Dr. Nilesh Vassan at the OU Health Sciences Center um, gave the team a very ambiguous challenge of improving robotic surgery in some way. And with the help of the team fellow, Ryan Phillips, and our uh, mentor, Chris Schilling, who also works at OU Health Sciences Center, the team definitely took that challenge and ran with it. They conducted over 20 different interviews with industry experts and surgeons themselves and they actually got the chance to see six robotic surgeries. They actually got to go into the OR and see these surgeries. It was fantastic. Um, this is an, a group of incredibly intelligent young men. Uh, I'm incredibly proud of the work that they've accomplished. So please join me in welcoming the fall 2014 Agile product design team. This semester, the Agile product design team was tasked to design a tool to increase the overall efficiency of robotic surgery. Is there a clicker? Sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Like Michael said, we were able to shadow six robotic surgeries, and we interviewed over 20 robotic surgeons from across Oklahoma to determine what was the major pain point that they were feeling with robotic surgery. And what we determined was that the biggest problem that they were having was with their electrocautery tools building char buildup uh, during surgery. As the surgery progresses, electrocautery tools tend to build up more and more char and require surgeons to clean this char more and more frequently. Current cleaning solutions are very time intensive, difficult, and frustrating to perform, leading to a uh, reduced uh, functionality of the tool, longer surgery times, and actually very, very irritated surgeons. <laughs> to combat this tool, we developed IV Tech a disposable surgical accessory that can be used to reduce current cleaning times by at least 60% and ensure a robotic surgeon's electrocautery tools can uh, uh, be used more frequently and will be clean and efficient throughout an entire surgery. Hi, I'm Andrew Stewart, a master's student in industrial and systems engineering from Edmond, Oklahoma. Hi, I'm Patrick Stevens, a senior in chemical engineering from Wichita Falls, Texas. My name is Jonathan Schick. I'm a senior double majoring in entrepreneurship and visual communication from Duncan, Oklahoma. Hi, I'm Derek Jones. I'm a biology junior from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Hi, I'm Ronnie Nagorin. I'm electrical engineering senior from Oklahoma City. Our inventor is Dr. Nilesh Fassen. Our mentor is Chris Schilling. And our team lead is Michael Petrie. This is a Da Vinci surgical system produced by Intuitive Surgical. It is the most advanced robotic surgery platform available on the market to date. It utilizes a surgeon console and a patient side cart that controls four robotic arms, one that has a high resolution camera, and three others that control the necessary tools to complete robotic surgery. At the console, a surgeon uses, or, uh, sorry, a surgeon ma views a magnified 3D image of the operating site and controls through the four robotic arms through scaled filtered motions that are then translated into very highly precise mechanical actions. The Da Vinci system seems to have it all. However, it has a problem. Its electrocautery tools that are used to cut tissue and to stop bleeding during surgery have a tendency to build up excess char on their tooltips, basically rendering them ineffective. Current cleaning solutions do not offer the, the time and do not offer efficient ways for surgeons to clean their tools. And surgeons are concerned with this cleaning time because addition sorry. Surgeons are con concerned with this cleaning time because uh, the clean time alone can add, up, add as much as 20% extra time onto an already lengthy robotic surgery procedure. The three main points that can be taken away from the cleaning issues facing robotic surgeons today are that they are time consuming for the surgeon, costly for the hospital, and potentially dangerous for the patient. 
Intuitive Surgical's recommended cleaning method is to take the tool out of the body, take it off the robot, wipe it down with a gauze or an abrasive pad, put it back on the robot, and then reinsert the tool back into the body. Now we've seen that this process can take anywhere from two to five minutes to complete per cleaning. And on average, as cleaning is needed every five to 10 minutes during surgery. This time totals over 42,000 hours that were spent just last year alone cleaning robotic surgery tools. This translates to $113 million cost just when considering operating times alone. To compensate for the long time it takes surgeons to clean their tools, they've adopted a method known as tool scraping, which involves taking two electrocautery tools and scraping them together to remove this excess char buildup. We've seen that tool scraping can prematurely dull tools and has caused for some tools to be thrown away prior to meeting their 10 use expected lifetime. This may not seem like a big deal, but on average, a single tool use per tool costs $300, adding up very quickly to a very high yet completely avoidable cost to the hospital. Additionally, tool scraping has been shown to be potentially dangerous to the patient. Because you're taking two electric cautery tool tips and scraping them together, an electrical current can arc between the two tips and burn the patient's surrounding tissue. Electrical arcing incidents are in fact so common that the FDA is pushing Intuitive to require surgeons to stop this method of tool scraping. Now surgeons are frustrated because they're using the most efficient way they can, but they're getting reprimanded by the surgical assistants and by sales reps from Intuitive to stop this method. They don't have another method to quickly and efficiently clean their tools until now. So now that we've talked about some of the problems surrounding robotic surgery tool cleaning, I'm gonna pass off to Patrick to talk about our solution to this problem. Thanks, Andrew. The solution our team proposes is Ivy Tech, the in vivo tool for electrocautery cleaning. Ivy Tech is a disposable laparoscopic instrument that allows surgeons to more effectively clean the robotic cautery tools without having to remove the robotic instruments from the patient's body. Ivy Tech has three primary components, a cleaning tip, a shaft about 20 inches long and five millimeters in diameter, and a laparoscopic handle. This laparoscopic handle is where a bedside assistant operates all of Ivy Tech's movements, as Ivy Tech is independent of the surgeon and the robotic surgical console. The assistant inserts Ivy Tech's tip through a laparoscopic port to the surgical site. At the surgical site, the surgeon can quickly and easily access Ivy Tech's cleaning tip. Now, one of the unique features of Ivy Tech is that it is easily adjustable, with the, with the tip being able to be adjusted up to 30 degrees. This illustration shows the entire Ivy Tech tool inserted into a patient's body with the tip bent at 30 degrees and a surgeon's instrument shown in purple interacting with Ivy Tech. A closer up view shows that the blades of the surgeon's cautery instrument being inserted into one of two openings on Ivy Tech's cleaning tip. The surgeon scrapes the blades against Ivy Tech's cleaning surface, thus removing the charred tissue. Now this cleaning surface has an egg crate-like structure and is made of a sponge-like material that is abrasive enough to remove the charred tissue, yet soft enough that will not scratch or dull the surgeon's cautery instrument. All of the materials involved in Ivy Tech's construction are made of medically safe polymers. This means that surgeons can be confident that there will be no adverse biological effects resulting from Ivy Tech's use. Ivy Tech's low-cost design stresses ease of use and safety. Ivy Tech is fast for the surgeon, safe for the patient, and cost-effective for the hospital. Because Ivy Tech is an in vivo cleaning solution that is easily accessible to the surgeon's cautery instruments, cleaning times may be reduced to less than 45 seconds. With cleaning times this fast, patients will spend less time under anesthesia, up to 24 minutes per surgery, thus decreasing the chance of complications by up to 14%. Ivy Tech is also safe to operate. Because it is made of plastics rather than metals, like many other laparoscopic instruments, there's no chance for electrical arcing between Ivy Tech and the cautery instruments themselves. Another unique feature of Ivy Tech's is the saline cooling system in integrated into its design. This cooling system enables cautery instruments exceeding 1600 degrees Fahrenheit to be cooled down to body temperature in less than three seconds. Finally, Ivy Tech is a cost-effective solution for hospitals for two reasons. First, Ivy Tech cleans robotic instruments without scratching or dulling them, thus extending their tool life to its full potential and reducing the number of tool replacements that the hospital has to purchase. Second, Ivy Tech is constructed of low cost materials at less than 10 cents per ounce. This makes Ivy Tech an inexpensive cleaning solution for robotic surgeries and hospitals. And on that note, I'll let John discuss how Ivy Tech fits into the marketplace. Thank you, Patrick. 
So we are very excited about the market that we're entering into because it's been growing at an annual rate of about 15% per year and is ex expected to continue growing at that rate as more DaVinci systems enter more hospitals across the country. Last year, there were 422,000 robotic surgeries reported just in the US, and that was broken up primarily between gynecology, urology, and general surgery. We have decided to focus primarily on urologic surgery because it is the most char intensive surgery, but that doesn't mean we're neglecting the other two. As we expand, our future markets include gynecology and general surgery because while the amount of charring isn't as intense as it is in urologic, it is still a problem that these surgeons face. And at a price point of $100 per unit, which is comparable compared to other disposable surgical tools, which range anywhere from $50 to $250 per tool, we have a total serviceable market as of 2013 of $42.2 million, and we expect that to continue growing as the number of surgeries in the surgical systems grows in the United States. So let's look at current cleaning solutions to see how we compare. Currently, what surgeons are doing to clean their tools include the cup spoon forceps, which is a general laparoscopic tool, which is primarily used for removing large chunks of tissue from the body, but don't do a very good job of removing the built-up charred tissue on the tool, rendering the tool ineffective inside of the body. The recommended method is the gauze and abrasive pads. However, this is time consuming, as Andrew mentioned, and can take anywhere from two to five minutes. And in a worst case scenario, we've been told it can take up to 10 minutes to remove these tools and clean them with this recommended method. And finally is tool scraping, which is the most common method, but is the most dangerous, is, is preferred by the surgeons because of its timeliness. So with IV tech, we look to, we're looking to take the safety of the cup spoon forceps, the effectiveness of the gauze pads, and the speed of the tool scraping and combining it into a single product for the surgeons to use. And we like IV Tech because of its patentability. It is the first in vivo cleaning tool for electrocautery tools. And we already have filed a provisional patent to protect this intellectual property. I'm going to pass it off to Derek now to tell you how we're going to get this into the hands of surgeons. Thank you, John. Our team has decided that the best way to get IV Tech to the market is to license to a medical supply vendor, as opposed to creating our own startup business. Licensing has a number of benefits. To begin, licensing will allow us to avoid the startup costs associated with creating our own business and manufacturing the product ourselves. Secondly, in our conversations with members of five different hospitals, we have found that hospitals seek to minimize the number of vendors that they use, meaning they're more likely to buy a product from an established vendor as opposed to a new startup. And finally, in our interviews with venture capitalists, we have confirmed that when you license a product to a vendor, that vendor will handle the FDA certification process an added bonus for us. Now, let's look at this licensing process. Our product, IV Tech, will be licensed to a medical supply vendor, such as Johnson & Johnson, for a standard licensing fee of 5% of future revenue. Those vendors have sales reps who are in constant communication with hospitals, such as Integris in Oklahoma City. The sales rep will get IV Tech into the hands of surgeons, where they will see that it makes their surgeries faster and safer for the patients. The surgeon will then request that the hospital buys that product, and the purchasing committee will approve that request, both because of the relatively low price point of $100 and the fact that it actually makes surgeries less expensive for the hospital. The hospital will pay $100 per unit to the vendor, and $5 of that will go back to the University of Oklahoma, where it will be divided between the university itself and the inventors. Now, let's look at the financials behind this. Due to the relatively expensive nature of the medical supply industry, and the low cost of producing IV tech, the vendor is looking to see an 80% gross profit margin and will break even after just 6,300 units are sold. Now this gross profit margin comes from the fact that the vendor is going to charge $100 for this tool. And $15 of that will go to the cost of manufacturing it, $5 will go to OU as the licensing fee, leaving $80 in profit for each sale. The cost of getting IV tech to the market will be about $500,000 for the vendor which means they will be able to break even after just over 6,300 units are sold, which should be in about month nine of operations. Moving forward, we have created a very conservative five-year financial model, which shows Ivy Tech producing $21 million in revenue in its fifth year, after breaking into gynecology in its third year and general surgery at the beginning of the fifth year. 
Now, during this time, while it's creating substantial profit for the vendor, it will also generate $2.1 million for the University of Oklahoma. We are very excited for the prospects of licensing IV Tech, and now I'm gonna hand it over to Ron Yu to tell you how we're going to make that happen. Thank you, Derek. So, this is a rough timeline that we have for the upcoming year for Ivy Tech. Uh, the, the team that will be taking over Ivy Tech will mainly consist of our inventor, Dr. Vassin, as well as a few of us APD members staying on as occasional consultants. So, first of all, we have filed a provisional patent, and OTD, the Office of Technology Development, will continue this final patent application process as well as uh, Dr. Vassin, and again, us as APD members with the occasional consultants will help polish the aesthetics and ergonomics of the final design of Ivy Tech, as well as continue to gain feedback from surgeons and their assistants. Now, we've already started a little bit on the manufacturing investigation, and our hopes is to continue this process and to have a manufactured prototype by the end of a six-month period, which can be then used in clinical testing. We've also drafted a pre-submission inquiry, which is a document you can submit to the FDA to ask any, qu any questions that you may have or clarification on the total FDA approval process. The aim is to use the information gained in this inquiry to approach vendors and to show them that, we are, that Ivy Tech will have a relatively quick path through FDA approval. And our hopes is to have a finalized licensing agreement with the vendor by the end of the six-month period, and this vendor can then continue on with the final FDA approval process. So the, the big thing about Ivy Tech is that it is a new invention that aims to uh, improve, the, improve robotic surgeries by reducing the cleaning time for cautery tools by at least 60%. In addition, it's offer, it'll be able to gain $2.1 million in revenue for the University of Oklahoma in its fifth year of operation and operates in a market that is growing at a rate of 15% each year. So the APD team here has had a great time this past semester going through many different ideas and iterations for Ivy Tech, and we've come up, we've gone through many different meetings and come, burned through hundreds of post-it notes coming up with new ideas, new ideas for Ivy Tech. In addition, we've also shadowed a number of surgeries, which is a very unique experience for all of us. So we'd like to thank CCW for the amazing time we've had this past semester. I'd like to give a special thanks to our inventor, Dr. Vassin, who's been a great help to our team during this project. For anyone who wants to learn a bit more about Ivy Tech, we have a booth set up out in the lobby. You can come see our prototypes hands-on. Thank you for listening. We'd like to open up the floor for questions. There are about 2,100 and something units across the United States that are in use. And there are several hospitals that have multiple systems and are able to perform multiple surgeries every day. Um, there is virtually no marketing cost because it's all done through direct sales with sales representatives. Um, the sales reps are in constant contact with these surgeons and as soon as they have a new product added to the portfolio that they think one of the surgeons that they're in contact with would be interested in, they just pitch it to them the next time that they're visiting that, that surgeon. The entire tool itself is disposable, so there would be one tool used uh, over the course of an entire surgery. Existing laparoscopic ports that the 
robot has to do to get inside the body, and they have a limited size. Right now, I think they're operating around eight millimeters in diameter, but they're moving towards smaller and smaller diameters. That's why we're, we're working with the five millimeter diameter for our tool. So there's limited space for us to get into the body, but this course already exists in the surgery. Currently, there's six that are used for each surgery, four that the robot uses, and two that our assistant uses. Um, and there's currently one that's not being utilized by our assistant, leaving space for us to come in and do something else with it. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, well, we expect other surgeons beyond urologic surgeons within a hospital that decides to purchase our product to use it um, to give us a more conservative uh, projection of growth in our revenues. We decided to have key focus on urologic and then gynecologic and then general to give us a more distributed growth. Right, I think we have time for one more question. No, we have not performed any testing yet. Uh, one of the challenges with, with this uh, product is that because of its uh, small size, that it's difficult to machine the parts and have everything at, on, the, uh, on the right scale. Uh, so that will be something that will be done moving forward with a manufactured prototype when a vendor has been uh, selected or during that process. The clinical testing that the tool might need to incur will not occur until after the FDA approval process has started and the number of clinical the amount of clinical testing uh, is known. One of the things that we do have set up for the product, though, is a willingness from the OU Health Science Center and a private practice, a private urologic practice in Norman to work with this product for clinical testing. I will add one thing. We did test the sponge that we're looking at using in the tip. Uh, we have tested burning it um, with saline and without saline, which is why we have decided to integrate that into the system, into our tool is the saline supply system in case uh, the tool is put in while it's still on or hasn't cooled off completely by the time it enters the tool. So we do know that the sponge we're looking at using and the tool tip will be able to withstand the heat of the electrocautery tools.